Baseball on Cape Ann dates back to just after the Civil War. Before modern rules were established, there were teams of nine in nearly every neighborhood playing for bragging rights. As baseball's popularity soared across America, leagues, exhibitions, and barnstorming teams became as big a part of summertime as ice cream and days at the beach. But in those early years, one player stood above the rest and rose to stardom. Today he remains the most accomplished professional athlete in Cape Ann's history. I'm Corey Kukuru for 1623 Studios, and this is the story of Stuffy McInnes. John Phelan McInnes was born in Gloucester on September 9, 1890, the fourth of five sons to Stephen and Uta Villa, who hailed from Nova Scotia. The McInneses lived on Warner Street, where Stephen took care of driving horses. The McInnes brothers fell for the baseball craze, practicing day and night with taped up balls of their mother's knitting yarn. They became standout athletes at Gloucester High School, but John was special. Just five foot eight, John was a multi-sport star in school, captaining state baseball championships in 1906 and 1907. His flawless defense at shortstop earned him the nickname Stuffy because after each great play, folks in the crowd yelled, that's the stuff, kid. Stuffy's play caught the eye of Dick Madden, the premier baseball promoter on the North Shore. Madden recruited Stuffy for a semi-pro team in Beverly, which featured adults and college players. Stuffy continued to excel. He left Gloucester High early to play for the Haverhill Hustlers, another semi-pro team. Before turning 18, Stuffy was earning $100 a month. Madden raved about the young phenom to a man he knew from the barnstorming circuit, Connie Mack. A Massachusetts native, Mack was a decent player and one of the major league's pioneers. He gained renown as the manager and part owner of the Philadelphia Athletics. Mack signed Stuffy to play for Philadelphia's farm team in New Bedford. Since Stuffy was underage, he couldn't legally play in the majors until the following season. In the meantime, he played to heavy fanfare all over the North Shore. A towny team in Lynn even held Stuffy McInnes Day to celebrate the big news. In March of 1909, Stuffy reported a spring training in Savannah, Georgia. The inimitable Mac, who managed games in a tailored suit, immediately took to the business like McInnes, who, like Mac, didn't smoke or drink. Stuffy made the opening day roster as a backup shortstop. Another A's prospect, Shoeless Joe Jackson, wasn't so lucky. Only 18, Stuffy was the youngest player in the American League. In six months, he went from Stage 4 Park to the grand opening of Scheib Park in Philadelphia, the country's first steel and girder ballpark that housed over 20,000 fans. For two seasons, Stuffy filled in at various positions, using his time to learn the game's nuances. The Philadelphia Athletics were becoming a dynasty. They won the World Series in 1910, after which Connie Mack replaced their aging star first baseman, Harry Davis, with Stuffy. Despite a short stature, Stuffy's fielding ability was off the charts. He introduced the first baseman stretch, reaching for throws by nearly doing splits and rarely made any errors. At the plate, he was an on-base machine, consistently batting over 300 and never striking out. Alongside Jack Barry at shortstop and Hall of Famers Eddie Collins at second and Frank home run Baker at third, Stuffy became part of what was famously known as the $100,000 infield. The A's dominated the American League and won titles in three of four seasons. Across the nation, the quiet and unassuming Stuffy was a household name. But in 1914, the heavily favored A's were swept in the World Series by the underdog Boston Braves. Connie Mack flipped out, demanding his players take pay cuts. Barry and Collins were traded. Baker quit. Stuffy stayed. McInnes' play didn't suffer, but the A's bottomed out. In another cost-cutting move, Mack traded Stuffy to the Boston Red Sox in 1917. It gave Mack salary relief and brought Stuffy home. Stuffy married Elsie Dow of Manchester, whose father owned a fish market on Summer Street. They built a house on Tappan Street just across Masconomo Park. It would be their home for over 40 years. That year at Fenway Park, Stuffy had another stellar season and the Red Sox faced the Chicago Cubs in the 1918 World Series. In Game 1, he drove in the game's only run for pitcher Babe Ruth, as well as the series clinching run in Game 6. It was the franchise's last title for 86 years. Stuffy and the Bay became pals. In the offseason, they barnstormed New England for a few extra bucks. In fact, they played an exhibition at Cooney Field in Beverly on October 10, 1919. Ruth homered. It was the last time Babe Ruth wore a Red Sox uniform. Just a few months later, well, we won't get into that. 
After a few seasons with the Sox, Stuffy played for the Cleveland Indians, then, at Elsie's insistence, signed with a local National League team, the Boston Braves, so they could start a family. McInnes lived the life. He toured Europe as part of an exhibition series under another legendary manager, John McGraw, where he met British royalty and the Pope. He even showed his skills as a basketball player for the original Celtics, a barnstorming club from New York City who inspired Boston's future pro franchise. Oh, he also recorded what ended up being the lowest score ever at Candlewood Golf Course in Ipswich, 5-under. At age 35, Stuffy made one last splash as a part-time player for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Down three games to one in the World Series to the Washington Senators, the grizzled veteran was put into the lineup to save the day. Stuffy strategized with his pitchers and positioned his fellow fielders perfectly. The Pirates rallied to win. It was Stuffy's fifth World Series, making him one of only a handful of players in Major League history to win it all with three different teams. Stuffy's playing career ended in 1926. Upon retiring, he managed the Philadelphia Phillies for a year before coming home. For the better part of three decades, Stuffy coached at the college and amateur levels, including a decade at Norwich University, before finishing his baseball career in 1954 after five seasons at Harvard. Stuffy quietly spent the rest of his days in Manchester with Elsie, their daughter Eileen, and their three grandchildren. He was a huge supporter of youth sports and often cheered on the high school, known then as Story School. Stuffy made a routine of getting his afternoon newspapers from the Manchester fruit store, chatting with kids along the way, and shooting the breeze with pals in the back room of the old Browns Market. The simple life of a superstar. John Stuffy McInnes passed away in 1960, just one year after Elsie. Both were laid to rest at Manchester's Rosedale Cemetery. Incredibly, despite a laundry list of achievements, records, and grassroots campaigns, Stuffy has yet to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Some say it's because he wasn't a home run hitter. Others say he was surrounded by flashier names. But the numbers don't lie. You be the judge. A career batting average of 307, hitting over 312 times. Top 10 all time for lowest strikeout ratio with at least 8,000 at bats. He's one of only two players who struck out less than 10 times in a season with more than 500 at bats. He's third all time in sacrifices. He had two streaks of 150 plus games without an error. He holds the American League record for fewest errors at first base in a season with a minimum of 150 games played. His fielding percentage was 990. That means he didn't make an error 99% of the time during his 19 year career. Stuffy McInnes was a stud. It's hard to believe that he's been overlooked and largely forgotten by baseball fans and the Hall of Fame. Then again, it's been a century since Stuffy McInnes' prime. How is it possible that of all the school stadiums, fields, and ballparks groomed around Cape Ann over the last hundred years, that none were named after Cape Ann's greatest athlete, John Phelan Stuffy McInnes? Maybe it's time to correct an error for the man who hardly made one. <laughs>